Uh, I thought I would just uh, rem remember a couple of highlights from the, from the first two lectures uh, to consolidate what we said then. Uh, in the first lecture, I talked about well, a lot of things, but uh, one theme that uh, comes to my mind is the theme of the moral purpose and uh, mission of uh, the finance community. Uh, and uh, we talked about the sense that uh, uh, I think young people have a sort of prejudice against the field, and they think that finance is a field that you go into if you really value money rather than people. Uh, and uh, I, I wanted to reiterate again that that's not the way I view the field at all. Uh, I was just yesterday, I gave a talk uh, in Montreal at the um, if I can say this right, Caisse de Depot et Placement, which is the uh, big uh, 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 wealth management fund for the province of Quebec. And I met a lot of people there, and I never once got the idea that anyone there was evil <laughs> or grasping. Uh, I think they have a moral purpose, which is uh, to uh, preserve the livelihoods of uh, the people of the province of Quebec. Uh, and so uh, you get a very different view of things uh, when you meet the people. Uh, I think uh, our entertainment industry likes to make movies about people in finance, but they are inevitably portrayed as evil, <laughs> and I don't know why that is. Uh, I don't think there has ever been a, a, mo a, a major motion picture about a uh, financial uh, person who ended up a philanthropist. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> uh, I just don't, people don't like, people would rather hate, I don't know why, it's something, um, wouldn't be a good movie theme, would it? Uh, anyway, uh, so you have to overcome these, so you have to think that if you go into the field, you would uh, probably end, if you're a success, you would probably end up as a philanthropist, but no movie will be made about your life, okay? <laughs> and you may encounter hostility the whole way. <laughs> It's especially true right now with the subprime crisis. Uh, there, pe people are blaming the financial community for our, our troubles now. And it is true that we're seeing some people thrown out of their houses, um, and in some cases because of some rather um, questionable financial practices who got people into mortgages that they shouldn't have gotten. Uh, but overall, I think that the people in, in this field are good people. Uh, in the last lecture, I talked about the second lecture. I talked about uh, the pooling of risks, and the basic theme of that lecture uh, was that we now have a mathematical theory, probability theory. And when you look at this theory, it you realize that it it suggests a very important technology for improving human welfare, and that is by spreading risks. Uh, the, the economy and technology and the weather and all sorts of factors create risks, uh, but the, the real technology is to the technology that works to eliminate risks uh, is to spread them out, to pool them, uh, share them among many different people, uh, and so uh, the idea, the the ideal that theory suggests, and it may be unreachable, but the perfect financial system would have all of our risks pooled completely. That is, nobody suffers alone. If anything happens to me in my livelihood, it's spread out over everybody. And everybody, that means the whole world, okay? And whatever happens to me when it's spread out over six billion plus people, it ends up <laughs> divided by one, uh, six billion and it becomes un- uh, observable. It becomes so small that it's meaningless. Uh, and so that's the ideal. That's what, what in, pr in principle, we can do. And that, I think, is the most important concept in finance, this concept of risk pooling. Uh, we live in a world where people suffer all kinds of misfortunes. And of course, we can try to get rid of these misfortunes. We can do research on disease prevention and weather uh, uh, modification, global warming. We can do uh, research on all these things, but um, uh, uh, there's another technology which is extremely important, which is even leaving the risks as they are, just sharing them better. Uh, and so I'll be talking more about this. The problem is that 
while the principle of risk sharing is very simple and obvious, the practice requires technology. So it's just like you could say, uh, you know, some of the principles of uh, mechanics are very obvious, but to make an engine uh, that operates uh, in terms of those principles is not obvious. Okay. So uh, what I want to talk today is about uh, what I call technology in finance, and I'll present my view of the of the situation. But maybe it's it's um, a rather idiosyncratic view that I have, but uh, I think it's uh, uh, it's not so much idiosyncratic as a different emphasis that I put forward. So what I want to talk I have there's really three themes to today's lecture: uh, a risk theme. A framing theme and an invention theme. So I want to go over the uh, kind of the history of risk management uh, and through these three themes. The first one is, uh, or I might say, a long-term risk theme. Uh, so let me go over these three themes. Uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, okay. So. Long-term risks are dominant in our lives. By that I mean that everyone's life is a sequence of shocks that accumulate over your life. Uh, in, I'm talking about economic shocks. When you start out young, we're, we, we're unequal as, at birth, of course, because of our parents and the advantages we have, but relatively equal uh, at a young age. As each year goes by, you accumulate economic shocks, shocks to your human capital, shocks to what you own as you get older. You start accumulate. You start your human capital is your ability to do things, and your knowledge, which is what rep which what you have to sell in the marketplace. As you get older, your human capital evolves, and it has its ups and downs as you as you age, uh, and uh, you start switching from human capital. To other forms of capital. In other words, you, you start saving, and you uh, you own stocks and bonds and real estate and other things. Each of these I I suffers a sequence of shocks that accumulate over your lifetime. So inequality gets worse and worse as people age, and it is at its worst after retirement, uh, when you are no longer you've exhausted your human capital and you're living off of all the accumulated physical capital. That's the life cycle story. There is great inequality among the elderly, uh, and uh, that's a problem. Some of them are living very badly; others are living with uh, uh, in <laughs> great comfort. Uh, so uh, that's what finance is about. It's really about people. We don't care at all about corporations. We should make that clear, except as they contribute to individual welfare. So. I don't care what happens to Citigroup or IBM, except for the fact that there are all those stockholders out there, uh, and uh, they're, they're of all different situations. Some of them are absolutely dependent on their holding of these stocks, and that's what we have to think about. And it's a long-term problem. So the, the problem with long-term risks also is that anything that we do to mitigate these risks creates moral hazard, and that's another fundamental theme of finance. What is moral hazard? That's a term that first entered the English language sometime in the mid-19th century, it, but of course the concept goes up earlier. Moral hazard occurs when a risk management institution incentivizes you to do bad behavior, to show bad behavior. And the classic example of moral hazard is fire insurance. I get fire insurance on my house, and so I behave badly. I deliberately burn the house down to collect on my insurance. That's moral hazard. But it's not unique to that. It's all over the place. When you manage risks, you create moral hazard. And that's why we need invention and theory in finance to, to minimize that. Okay. Uh, the second theme for this lecture is about framing. Uh, and by that I mean psychological framing, uh, and there's many psychologists who talk about this. 
but notably Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Uh, framing, psychological framing means the tendency for people to view things uh, in a distorted way de depending on how they're presented. If I present things in one frame, you would react one way. I, I present the same thing in another context or background or uh, environment, and you react very differently. Uh, so I'll expand on this uh, in a minute. Um, and uh, the third theme uh, is the invention theme of this lecture. Uh, and that is that I mentioned this before, but I want to expand that in this, in this lecture. That uh, finance, the history of finance is the history of invention just as much as it is in other fields, notably engineering. Um, the idea that I want to develop is that the history of finance is a history of discrete inventions. Uh, that uh, non-obvious ideas that were conceived of to solve these problems of, of long-term risks and to get around the uh, psychological barriers uh, uh, imposed by framing uh, uh, biases, that psychological biases, to allow people to actually manage the risk and to get around moral hazards. Uh, it's a d difficult thing to do these things, and that's why we need invention. Uh, and another th thing uh, is that when once an invention is made, it tends to be copied all over the world. So the history of finance is largely a history of copying, uh, and that's what you have to do. You may have to adapt it to a particular environment, but basically it is copying other ideas. Uh, some people in less developed countries feel uncomfortable that they are just uh, slavishly copying other more advanced countries, uh, but they have to recognize that that is the what everybody has been doing all along. We copy the good ideas, and in the process, we adjust them and make them a little bit better. And new ideas can come anywhere. The, the basic thing, though, is every country has to take the insights that have been developed uh, around, around the world. Okay, uh, so uh, let me uh, come back now. I want to go through these three themes. Let me start with. Uh, the uh, long-term risk theme, uh, and the uh, I wanted to start with uh, an article which uh, mentioned an article by uh, um, Bacchus Kidland and Kehoe. Actually, Bacchus Kehoe and Kidland, which are three economists. Uh, Uh, one of these, uh, the last of the three, is Finn Kinlan, won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. Um, but in this article, they talk about the correlation of consumption around the world. What is consumption? These are it's the amount that people spend on consumption goods, things that you buy for your current uh, use, like food, shelter, clothing. Uh, Etc. Uh, every country, every country, computes an estimate of how much is spent each year on the consumption of the people who live in the country. What uh, what Kehoe, Bacchus Kehoe and Kidland did is looked at how much the consumption correlates, the the movements from uh, from year to year correlate across countries, uh, and if there were perfect correlation, it would be a correlation of one. That is. When one country's consumption increases from one year to the next, every other country's consumption increases from one year to the next. What they argued in this paper is that if we had perfect risk management, there would be perfect correlation of consumption across countries. Because if, if we get rid of the idiosyncratic risks, all that's left is planet-wide risks. Okay? If we had perfect financial markets, and this is intuitive, and maybe I, I don't know how obvious this is. It's obvious to me, uh, but it, it's an intuitive point of great importance. Nobody would suffer alone. Okay, anytime there's a risk that hits one person or one country, the financial markets would spread it out over everybody, and it gets very small. What's left? The only risks that are left are risks that everyone shares. 
Okay? And so you would see planet-wide risks expressing themselves in consumption, but nothing else. Do you see that point? So we'd have perfect correlation? Suppose the planet were hit by a comet. Okay, this happened, uh, something like this happened 65 million years ago, so it could happen again. Um, maybe it won't. Now we have better plans to prevent things like that. But suppose it, it did happen, all right? Uh, we would see huge damage on the impact site. Let's neglect the fact that some people would be killed by the impact, okay? Let's suppose it was just economic damage. Uh, and so it would be a terrible disaster, but it would, be a, it would be a problem all over the world, right? Because the damage would extend around the world. But you'd be much better off if you were on the other side of the world, not where it hit. Uh, if we didn't have financial uh, arrangements, then the people near the impact would be in terrible economic situation, and the people on the other side would be much better off. But if we had the proper risk management institutions in place, People would have anticipated this risk and have made swaps or other arrangements to protect themselves against it. And so what would happen? Uh, the people near the impact would not be harmed any more than anyone else. The whole world would suffer because the damage is substantial and it reduces our ability to produce. So the whole world, everyone's consumption around the world would go down. You can't prevent that. Anything that hits the whole planet would, would be affected. Uh, so Bacchus, Kidlin, and Kehoe thought that that's the situation we should be in today. And there are things hitting the whole world, like global warming, for example. Uh, and there are many of them. Uh, but how well are we doing? We're not doing well at all, they concluded. The correlation across countries in consumption changes is low. In fact, it's lower than the correlation of income changes, which is <laughs> surprising. So it means like we really haven't done anything. Uh, uh, that's an exaggeration. We've done very little uh, to manage uh, manage uh, risks that individual that countries face, for that matter, or even individuals face. So uh, the w we've we've done a lot. I shouldn't say we haven't done anything, but we we can do a lot more. Uh, the idea of risk uh, that risks economic risks can be pooled is an intuitive one that has occurred to people throughout history. It's very simple and obvious. If we're living in, uh, imagine we're living in some remote area and we're pioneers uh, out there with our cabins and uh, there's no government, there's no one to protect us, what do we instinctively do? We kind of meet together and we say, you know, if anyone's cabin burns down, we'll all come over and help, all right? It's, you know, it kind of feels like a generosity or something, but it's also a self-interest that people perceive you know, it could be me that uh, my cabin could burn down and I would freeze to death in, in the winter. And so people naturally and spontaneously make arrangements uh, to share risks. Uh, but these kind of natural and spontaneous arrangements are not global. They're not big enough and important enough. Uh, so I, I just want one, one point of this lecture is to try to e emphasize the real um, breadth of the concepts of finance and how important they are. Uh, how they reach out into other things that you might not think as associated with finance. Uh, so I wanted uh, to mention um, uh, socialism. This term really goes back to um, Robert Owen, who was a British uh, thinker, uh, 1771 to 1858. Um, who uh, wanted to pool all the economic activity in society. And what were the motivations for doing this? Well, I think he would say inequality, uh, um, hardship that <laughs> will be reduced. But what was he really saying in a sense? You might say it's risk management. He wanted society to pool risks uh, and put things, uh, uh, put us together. Uh, so in his ideal society, socialist society, uh, everyone would, uh, all the consumption would move up and down together, just as in uh, the ideal that Bacco, Bacchus, Kehoe, and Kidland expressed, right? Uh, so Robert Owen uh, uh, wanted to do act, wanted to create this community, and uh, he created finally, he emigrated to the United States, and he set up a city called New Harmony. New Harmony was 
Yeah, it's supposed to be an inspiration. Unfortunately, it didn't work very well because uh, people started bickering in his town, uh, and the new harmony became kind of a, uh, a, a joke. It was not a harmonious community. So uh, he started to discover uh, moral hazard. Okay. You put everyone together and you say, okay, all of your economic fortunes are the same. And, and what does someone start to conclude? Well, they start to get lazy, <laughs> or they start to get irresponsible. They think, it doesn't matter what, uh, what I, um, uh, what I uh, do, I'm going to get the same consumption as everybody else, so I'll just get lazy. Very fundamental problem, which you probably are already aware of. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, socialist idea started to lead to a number of experiments in various uh, countries around the world uh, that uh, were uh, pooling risks. And they, they might not have put it this way. Uh, one is the kibbutzim in Israel, and these were communities that shared everything. Um, originally, they were very rigid about this. That they enforced complete sharing. If, if you belonged to a kibbutzim, you were uh, completely uh, stuck with the uh, the, the, the common consumption. Uh, but it wasn't just in Israel. In Japan, the Ito N and the Yamaguchi Kai uh, in the United States, the Hutterites, and there's many other examples. Uh, joining one of these communities uh, has meant. Um, a real change in your life. Uh, it's complete sharing. Uh, the problem is, again, uh, the, 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 uh, the ideal, they're trying to work toward, I think, an ideal that we see in finance, namely the, the perfect correlation of consumption and the elimination of risk. We all help each other. But the problem they hit is moral hazard. Uh, and uh, I, I've heard stories about uh, a lot of bickering <laughs> at the kibbutzim. Uh, when someone gets a gift, and, and the other people at the kibbutz team say, well, you can't have that by yourself. We share everything. Uh, some people say, I'd like to have my own television set, and I don't want to go to the common room and watch the same set with everyone else. You know, I just kind of want to be at home by myself. So nowadays, kibbutz teams have loosened the rule. I, I don't know these things in, uh, personally, but uh, it's my understanding that uh, the whole structure is suffering some moral hazard problems. And uh, that uh, uh, they are evolving and trying to improve the institutions, but uh, uh, there's also a problem with risk sharing at that level, and that is that if you are one of these um, commune communities, you're just a small number of people. The best you can do sharing among yourselves is sharing your own risk, the risk of your own community, but your own community goes up and down. And you're not sharing widely enough. The problem is that if you want to do risk sharing, you're not ideally sharing with someone who's just like you, living in Israel, uh, working in a certain agricultural uh, 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 industry, because there's a lot of risks that you already share. You should be sharing your risk with someone who's completely different, probably living on the other side of the world in a completely different industry, where the, you know the weather and the uh, institutions and the political situation is completely different. But th th it doesn't work so easily to share with those people along the lines that these communities have. I think these uh, communes tended to emphasize a, a social compact, a, a feeling for each other, a caring for each other, which is a lovely thought, but it doesn't achieve risk management on a big scale. Uh, and so. Uh, so I think that what's happening is these ideas, are, everything is evolving. So I'm actually presenting here our uh, modern finance as the outgrowth of socialism, <laughs> but that's not the usual way, uh, the usual way to present it. Well, but it, I guess it is. It's that we care about each other and we don't want people to suffer alone. We want to share things. But we want to get more scientific about how we share things. And that means we want and we want to be effective. So that means we have to devise ways of sharing with people 
that we never met, we don't care about, I mean, maybe we care about everybody, but we don't have any particular emotional ties to them. They're very different people. Uh, but because of the logic of risk management, we have to make a deal with them. So it becomes more formal and impersonal, and that is what uh, financial markets do. Um, so what, what's happening is we're seeing an evolution of risk management, and you hear about it in various terms that sound abstract. So we have private equity, we have venture capital, uh, and, and we have employees getting incentive options. These are efforts to uh, er solve the moral hazard problem and to manage risks. Uh, and uh, I, I believe that we're gradually learning uh, in our society. Th this is maybe not widely appreciated, but every decade that goes by, we do a better job of incentivizing people and preventing them from being discouraged by, uh, by uh, risks. So uh, 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 it's a very complicated situation because the kind of economic risks that we face are, uh, are difficult for most people to understand. Uh, but uh, but they have to try to we have to try to let people manage their own risks for themselves to some extent. That means we have to expect people to understand these things somewhat. I think we have an important role for economic edu or financial education. Because of that, uh, each person is in a different situation. It's a very complicated world, and we have uh, uh, many different risks. So. Um, uh, Okay. Well, now, uh, continuing on the risk theme, I, I mentioned one uh, philosopher, Robert Owen. Uh, I could have also mentioned Karl Marx. Why don't I mention him here? <laughs> uh, a very important thinker uh, who had very low regard for the financial community, I think, un unfortunately. Uh, he wanted to kill them, I think, <laughs> or at least some of them. Uh, it, uh, nonetheless, he shared certain things in common with them, namely that he was concerned about inequality, about some people doing badly, and he proposed a, uh, uh, a, uh, an economic alternative that, uh, that, would, uh, uh, that would pool risks. And in fact, um, he actually uh, 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 emphasized a concept that was um, first stated by a French philosopher, Louis Blanc, in the mid-19th century. And the, the, uh, Blanc said, uh, the ideal society is, and now I quote, is, uh, every, the, the ideal society is based on the principle of, and now I quote, from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. Have you heard that quote before? Uh, Karl Marx quoted Blanc, but he didn't. Uh, credit Blanc. <laughs> he didn't mention the name because I, I assume he thought everyone knows this was Blanc. But um, Marx was falsely attributed to having made that statement. Uh, and it's come around to us that that was the, a lot of people say that was the core of his communist philosophy. That is complete risk sharing, right? Some of us have high abilities and we succeed, some of us have low abilities and we fail. But we all get the same good. We all have our needs satisfied, uh, and so that I think is I think the communist system is effectively a theory of risk management, and that's not something that you might think of usually. What was the big problem with communism as it was espoused by Karl Marx? The problem was that it had a moral hazard problem. And I just have already been through it. It's the same moral hazard problem that you see at the Kibbutzim and the uh, Yamaguchi Kai and other places, that people don't work effectively when their economic interests are completely pooled. And so, uh, 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 well, I suppose we've learned from uh, the Marxian experience, but uh, uh, we're, I think uh, just about every country of the world now recognizes that uh, it's a complicated thing to get risk management working well, and we have to uh, design things uh, more carefully. We can't just smash things 
and start all over. We have to design a system of risk management. And that's what I think finance is about. I wanted to mention uh, a couple other uh, philosophers uh, who talk about risk management. Uh, one of them is the economist John Harsanyi, who uh, won the Nobel Prize in economics uh, some years ago. Uh, and another one is the philosopher John Rawls, who wrote the book Theory of Justice, uh, which has become a classic. And I think of both of these as, um, as incorporating, I, I would, especially with Harsanyi, but also with Rawls, as incorporating some idea of risk management into our basic philosophy. Uh, so we have a, uh, a philosophy that uh, most of us, that uh, uh, some kind of uh, economic in inequality is a bad thing, uh, and that it's unjust for someone uh, who is, uh, for no fault of his or her own, is suffering economic hardship. Uh, but uh, how to formalize this idea? John Harsanyi was the first to write about this. He said that we should think of, when we think about distributional justice, we could think of it as a risk management problem. And that, uh, he said, imagine that uh, we could get people to have a big town meeting for the whole world, um, and he said, before they were born, okay? So there's some space up in heaven where all the unborn babies are <laughs> that will live in the future. And uh, unfortunately, they're not able to have a town meeting, but let's suppose they could, all right? Uh, and so uh, we're up there in heaven thinking about our lives in the future as people. Uh, and uh, what would we do? Uh, suppose we don't know what economic circumstances we'd be born into and what kind of contingencies we'd have in life. What would we decide? Suppose we were trying to decide on a constitution for the world uh, in, that in that state. John Rawls expanded on this, and he called it the original position. Uh, so what would they do? Well, they would probably agree that we'll do some risk sharing, right? Every, everyone is thinking, I don't know whether I'll be rich or poor, and so I would like to have a world in which uh, risks are shared. Um, on the other hand, what would you decide, if you can imagine yourself in that situation, what would you decide about inequality? Would you decide to have a world with absolute equality? Uh, well, you know, uh, somebody would probably, suppose someone proposed that up in heaven now, <laughs> and someone else might say, well, that's not going to work so well. That's like a kibbutzim, a kibbutz, like one of the kibbutzim. Uh, it's not going to work. It, we're not going to enjoy it. We're not, something's wrong with that, because it, it, it's going to create a moral hazard problem, and we're not going to be as productive. Uh, someone might also say, you know, a little inequality, even a substantial inequality, is not so bad, as long as nobody is really suffering, as long as everyone has the basic needs and they're, we can all be happy. But, you know, let's let some people make a big fortunes, because that provides spice in life and some adventure that, something to look forward to, that you might get this. And so you could see saying, we, we don't want to eliminate inequality. Uh, so, uh, uh, what Harsanyi and Rawls both uh, gave us is a system of justice that, in my mind, conveys a sense of financial risk management. Um, now, I, I, I'm not going to talk a lot about. Um, uh, well, I'm going to move also to framing here, but uh, let me uh, let me at this point mention something about public finance. This is not a course in public finance. It doesn't say. The, the title of this course is Financial Markets. I guess when you put markets on, that doesn't sound like public finance, but even so, it, it could. Public finance is the financial issues relating to governments, okay? And finance usually means the private sector, but the issues are much the same in both cases. So let me say something about public finance here. Uh, and, and so, uh, public finance uh, relates to the tax and welfare system that we have. 
the government taxes people uh, and it um, takes some of the money uh, and redistributes it to people in need. Uh, and this is essentially a risk management system. It's uh, something that I suppose Robert Owen and Karl Marx would have said, sounds like a good thing, but of course they wanted to do much more <laughs> and be more comprehensive. But it's, it's maybe uh, something that has evolved as something that actually works. A, you have a progressive tax system that takes more money from the wealthier people, and you have a welfare system that looks at individual hardship and, and pays out. Uh, it does create moral hazard problems. Uh, that's a problem with it, but that's something that uh, we're learning about. That's part of public finance is learning how to modify uh, the, um, the tax system so that it works pretty well. Uh, but I wanted to start out by mentioning taxes and welfare because I think that it's really the most important risk management system already in place. Because the financial risk management system that we have is imperfect, we aren't there yet. Uh, the thing that's really doing the heavy hitting on our risk management is, is really the tax and welfare system. Because that's because the most important risks that individuals face is the risk of major losses of income. So if something really hits you hard and you would be starving, uh, that's, that's really bad. And so nobody starves in, in, in advanced countries of the world today. And that's because of this system. Moreover, you might get hit by an illness, and then you could be in desperate trouble that you will die unless, uh, unless you get some kind of emergency care, which might be very expensive. So every advanced country in the world has a system that provides for this, including the United States, <laughs> incidentally. We don't have a national health care system. Uh, it, we, people say we don't. Well, we, we don't, but we do have an emergency care system so that anybody who is suddenly stricken will be taken to a hospital and taken care of. Uh, it's not perfect, but it is there, and so it, what we do have, we should be thankful for. Uh, it's very important. So I thought this would be a good lead into the second theme of this lecture, which is framing. Uh, and uh, th th we have a good system in the taxes, but it's, it's uh, imperfect. Uh, because it hasn't been thought out thoroughly in terms of risk management. Uh, so let's talk about framing and taxes. If you go to uh, look at congressional discussion of tax rates, you won't see risk management mentioned very often. Uh, they, uh, uh, they, t they seem to talk about it in their own terms, which sound to uh, a public finance expert is, uh, I don't know, very uh, populist or uh, unprofessional. Uh, I guess they're elected officials, and their voters uh, are not finance theorists and don't think of these in these terms. Uh, but uh, the um, there's a uh, Edward McCaffrey did a history of taxes. He's a, a law professor. Uh, Uh, in the United States, and asked about, um, I'm sorry, McCaffrey, CA, capital CA, uh, two C's, <laughs> M C C A F F E R Y, uh, uh, based on uh, issues of uh, framing and uh, psychology. So we have a system which you say it, it really, the tax, the progressive tax system is very important. Uh, but it, um, it's not conceptualized right. Uh, so what McCaffrey points out is that the only time the government in the United States has ever been able to impose high taxes on wealthy people is during wars. <laughs> and uh, if you look at the history of U.S. taxes, the very simple history is World War I and World War II. During World War I, our men were out dying in Europe. And people would vote for someone who said, let's raise the taxes on the rich. Someone profiting from this war now um, doesn't sound right when other men are out there dying. So they raised taxes during World War I. 
They did it again, even more decisively in World War II. And that's how we got progressive taxes. Uh, I'm oversimplifying a little bit. Uh, but um, uh, between wars, <laughs> the rate tends to come down uh, because uh, people think, well, the war is over. They don't understand the risk management function of it. Uh, and politicians are reluctant to cut taxes, but they do it gradually. So that's a simple history of, of taxes. Uh, but um, uh, so um, actually, the in the United States, the income tax came in during the American Civil War, uh, and um, uh, there uh, it was. Uh, the income tax came in in 1861, uh, again, during a war. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was a progressive tax. The tax, in, uh, as of 1862, was 3 percent on incomes over $600 a year. <laughs> that sounds kind of low. That was 1862. And then they raised it to uh, 5 percent on incomes over Ten thousand dollars. It was the beginning, uh, but it didn't. Uh, it didn't take because they had technical problems. Uh, but uh, so uh, the I, I mentioned this tax example because I wanted to stress that uh, framing uh, and psychological barriers are important problems uh, for uh, creating financial markets. Um, so, um, uh, the idea is that if people don't see this basic risk management problem, and they see things in entirely different terms. Uh, uh, so, Kahneman and Tversky talked about how people view uh, financial gains and losses, uh, and they talked about how people's actions are very um, malleable, depending on how things are presented. One of their most famous examples, they asked people the following question. Suppose you had bought expensive tickets to a concert, okay? Very expensive. You paid $200 for each ticket, and you have two tickets, $400 worth, okay? And on the way to the concert, you lose the tickets, okay? And so now you've arrived at the concert hall and you're looking through your pockets and you don't you, you realize they're gone, you've lost them. And then the question they ask people is, would you go to the window and buy another pair of tickets for four hundred dollars, okay, having lost it? And that people were answered, most people said no, I'd be so annoyed and angry with myself, I'd just leave. But then they said, so then they, they posed a different version of the same question. And the different version was suppose you had ordered tickets to pick them up and pay for them at the window uh, at the concert hall, and you brought $400 in cash in your pocket, okay? And now you arrive and you realize you've lost your $400, okay? But now the choice is you could, wh wh what are you going to do? Would you go to the ticket window? and uh, use your credit card to pick up the tickets? Or would you just walk away in anger and annoyance? Well, m most people say, oh, I would just go to the window and buy the tickets. Um, right? D does that sound plausible, that you can see the difference? B but in economic terms, there's no difference between losing the tickets and losing $400. <laughs> so why do you behave differently? Well, that's framing. Because in your mind, you're putting tickets and cash in different mental accounts. And so the mental account tickets generates an emotional feeling, uh, and it changes my action that I lost in that account. Um, and so, unfortunately, that's, th that's the unfortunately, people's decisions are biased by that kind of thing. So we have to frame things as. Uh, as it, it puts things in the mental categories, the presentation matters 
uh, so that people can uh, manage their risks right. Uh, Kahneman and Tversky also, and others, have also talked about insurance. They've asked people uh, a question, uh, and they've phrased it in two different ways. One of them was, would you buy insurance against such and such a risk? Okay? Uh, and the same question was rephrased in another way without mentioning the word insurance. They just described it. <laughs> they said, would you sign a contract that if you made, had this loss, the contract would pay you a certain amount of money? Uh, and the percent of people who say yes to that is lower because they didn't put it in an insurance frame. And so we're accustomed to thinking of insurance as a good thing. And if I talk about it in general terms, they might not put it in that frame and they might not act. Uh, really, an important example of framing uh, is how we deal with uh, money and, and uh, indexation. So uh, we have a money frame of thinking and a real frame. The value of money changes through time. That's because of inflation or deflation. Uh, and yet, most of our debts are written in money terms. That is, they're not indexed for inflation. So if you wanted to have an, a, a real frame, you would index to this consumer price index or some other inflation index. Okay? Uh, but most of us are accustomed to a money frame. So most of us, when we lend money to each other, we do it in money terms. You merely say, so for example, if, if your friend asked to borrow $100 from you, uh, you would probably not say, you might actually put interest on this person. So you could say, all right, I'll do it 5% interest, pay me back in a year. Uh, you would probably not even think to say, pay me 3% interest plus the rate of inflation <laughs> over the next year. Uh, that would be putting it in a real frame. Uh, and wouldn't that be more sensible? Because you would be specifying the contract in real terms rather than money terms. Uh, and yet, most people just don't do that. So most of our fixed incomes, as they're called, which are um, assets that are denominated in currency, most of our debts are written in money terms. And people can't get over this framing in terms of money. It's a powerful psychological, you might say an illusion. Uh, people think they want money when in fact they should want real goods and services. So that's an exam example of uh, a framing issue. Um, okay, now I want to move to uh, the third theme uh, of this lecture, which is uh, invention. Uh, and uh, so, uh, as I said, in, uh, progress in finance requires an inventive process. Uh, and invention uh, is, uh, occurs in a uh, milieu of other invention, no notably uh, information technology. I said this in an earlier lecture, but a financial device is a, dev is a complicated device uh, like any engine or, uh, uh, or um, <laughs> uh, any other thing that they, uh, they patent and develop by, uh, uh, to solve some physical problem. Uh, so for example, uh, let's talk about an insurance policy. Okay. Uh, as an invention. An insurance policy, the, uh, the concept is very simple. We could talk about uh, fire insurance or life insurance. Uh, uh, life insurance is uh, designed to protect, ideally, it protects parents uh, with young children. That's the most important application. So if one of the parents dies, uh, it be creates hardship for the family because the remaining parent has the burden of caring for children and earning a livelihood to support all of them, and it, it is very difficult. Uh, so we have a policy that pays them <laughs> if, uh, uh, if one of them dies. But uh, 
it's not so easy to devise this. In the concept is very simple. So in order to, to devise an insurance contract that does this job, uh, we have to have a contract between an insurance company and the insured. The contract has to specify what are the causes of, uh, let's say, a death or, or a situation in which one is covered. We have to then realize that there is a moral hazard problem. We have to exclude certain causes, like suicide in the case of life insurance. Uh, in other kinds of insurance, it gets very complicated. Uh, you have to exclude those causes that generate moral hazard problems for the insurance to work. Otherwise, the whole system will fail. When they invented fire insurance in the 1600s, there was a lot of skepticism because, hey, anyone can burn down their house. And they said, it's not going to work because you have to decide how much the house is insured for. And then anybody that, if you ever make a mistake and you insure it for too much, then the people who, who realize they've got one on the insurance company, they've insured the house for more than it's worth, they'll burn down their house and collect the money. And how can the insurance company ever evaluate every house properly to avoid that? So they had to work on that. They had to devise, they had to get a, an appraisal industry that could appraise houses and get some idea of what they're really worth. And they had to get that all worked out. It had to be done accurately. And they had to decide to keep a certain amount of coinsurance. In other words, lower the amount insured below the actual value of the house to prevent moral hazard. Um, and uh, they had to develop statistics. Of loss, they had to know what the losses were. So, in the case of life insurance, they developed actuarial tables, and then that required the collecting of statistics. Uh, and then, of course, there's the other problem that the insurance company. Uh, how does the insurance company reasonably specify that it can come through on this policy? Um, so, you have to have the insurance company set up with a structure itself that guarantees that they have enough reserves. To meet the losses that they might incur, uh, and so that requires a, a theory of the capital, and you have to—they're going to have to invest the reserves in financial assets, and then you have to ask, well, how are the financial assets going to behave over time? And then it becomes a theory of all of finance that comes in as well. And then, moreover, that beyond that, how does one know in taking out an insurance policy that the insurance company is going to be sound? Uh, so the insurance company has to have some way of demonstrating its soundness to the public. Moreover, we have regulators who have to regulate insurance companies and, and uh, make sure that they have adequate capital. Uh, so it is a very complicated industry. And uh, although I said insurance was effectively discovered or invented in the 1600s, it has been slow to grow because they didn't have the well-defined all of the inventions. Yet, um, so uh, 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 I wanted to just give some. <laughs> uh, so often the inventions that occur in finance they seem in a way obvious. Uh, some of the things I said you'd probably say, well, I should have known that an insurance company would have to do that, uh, but it isn't. You know what's obvious after the fact is not what's obvious before the fact. And one thing I like to stress is that the history of technology is sometimes a history of very glamorous, unobvious ideas, like nuclear power. That's amazing, right? You can get atoms to smash atoms <laughs> and create a chain reaction and create power. That's pretty amazing uh, invention. But a lot of the inventions that matter to us are extremely simple. They're kind of staring in your face, obvious. Uh, so let me just give some example of, uh, and sometimes people are very slow to see the obvious, or it seems so in history. So I like to talk about the invention of the wheel. <laughs> That's the most famous invention, right? It's a cliche. People say, let's not reinvent the wheel here. Uh, so let's go back to that. Uh, inventing the wheel, it seems, uh, what could be more obvious than a wheel? Uh, well, it apparently is not so obvious because in uh, the Americas, before the uh, Colum Columbus came, pre-Columbian America, there were no wheeled vehicles anywhere. We had civilizations, Aztecs, Mayas, Incas, etc. No wheeled vehicles. Uh, now the amazing thing is 
if you go to Mexico, you can go to museums that have children's toys from pre-Columbian Mexico with wheels. They were little toys that they would, they would be shaped like animals or something, and you could roll them along the floor. So why didn't somebody think of that? You're sitting there with your child playing with a wheeled toy, and then you're going out to carry some heavy stuff, and you're dragging it along the ground. Why didn't you think of putting wheels under it? Uh, well, it's apparently not so obvious. So some very obvious ideas uh, are not so obvious. So some people today think, I just can't imagine, this history can't be right. Uh, I don't believe that they hadn't invented wheels in America before uh, Columbus. So to argue with them, I point out an example which is more familiar. Uh, unfortunately, you people are too young uh, to have experienced this, but uh, um, I've experienced this, and you can talk to your parents. Uh, it used to be, before 1972, that suitcases never had wheels. Never, never had wheels. Okay. Uh, you probably own a wheeled suitcase, right? <laughs> Some, most of you do. Uh, the idea of putting wheels on suitcases goes back only to 1972, uh, and it was uh, Bernard Seydal uh, who invented, this is amazing, right? The wheeled suitcase, and he got a patent on it. Uh, and he had a suitcase that, uh, I don't know exactly, what, something like this, it had you had a strap that you'd pull it along, and it had four little wheels on the bottom, uh, and it worked. So uh, he's, uh, 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 I had my student research assistant see, can you find that guy? Let's call him up and ask him about it. It's so recent. So we, my student called Bernard Seydal up and asked him about his invention, and he said, "Yeah, I was thinking, you know, why don't we have wheels on suitcases?" So I just did it, you know. And, and then he said, but I had a lot of trouble. I took it to department stores, and I said, uh, uh, let's, why don't you sell this? I'm making it. Add it to your luggage. And he said he met a lot of resistance. Uh, the department stores said no. And uh, so we asked, well, why would they say no? I mean, it's such an obviously good idea. And he said, well, they said people won't buy it. Uh, and anyway, they said, look, you go to any train station, and there are these red caps or porters, and they'll carry your suitcase for you. You don't need wheels. Uh, that's what they told him. But it seemed like there was kind of a way of thinking. I think maybe people would be embarrassed. If you were the only guy with wheels <laughs> on your suitcase, people would think you look a little odd. Uh, and so, uh, uh, but anyway, I it's interesting. Uh, the uh, wheeled suitcase came in uh, in 19. Uh, uh, 1972. The problem with um, Seydal's suitcase, I actually had one, and you might have one in your attic, and you can go up and look at it, <laughs> because your parents probably bought one, and it's still up there. Uh, you can take it out and try wheeling it along with that strap. And it kind of works, but it uh, wobbles. You know, you're, especially if you're hurrying to catch your airplane, that thing starts fishtailing and wobbling. You, you just got a strap you're pulling it on. Uh, so. Uh, obviously, there was a design defect. Finally, it was uh, Robert Plath, who was an airline pilot, who invented a new wheeled suitcase, which he patented in 1991. Okay, and this suitcase had, uh, instead of having four little wheels on the bottom, it had two wheels on the back, and you you didn't pull the suitcase lengthwise; you pulled it widthwise, so it gave you a stable base. Moreover, instead of having a strap. He had this thing that you, a rigid thing that you pull out from this. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and he invented, he called it the roller board. Uh, he also had the idea that he would make it narrow enough so that when you're boarding an airplane, you can still roll it down the aisle of the airplane. It just fit perfectly. So that was the roller board. That was 1991. That's getting into recent memory, right? It's so obvious. Why didn't they have them before? Well, things that seem obvious are not obvious. And it has something to do with something like framing or more. We tend to think of doing things in a certain way. Everyone else is doing it. We assume that that's the smart way to do things, uh, and uh, and so uh, that that uh, limits us. And so uh, it's very hard to get new ideas started, but they do get started. And so I think we'll get some really obvious um, advances. One thing about inventions is that we have something called the patents. 
the um, patent office grants patent rights to um, uh, uh, inventions, but traditionally, in uh, everywhere in the world, really, uh, financial inventions were not considered worthy of patenting uh, because I guess patent law uh, came in in response to things like the steam engine and the the, the power loom, and they were physical inventions. And they didn't think of financial inventions as worthy of patents, uh, but uh, now uh, we're starting to see patent offices accepting financial devices. So it, it happened in the late 1990s in the United States that uh, patent offices started to accept financial patents, uh, and uh, uh, now there's several countries that uh, I think it's Japan, Korea. Uh, uh, and uh, elsewhere, they're starting to see financial invention as a serious, uh, as a as serious invention. Uh, now, the, the last uh, uh, thing is um, uh, uh, in information technology as as a driver of finance. Uh, And I'd like to stress information technology because we are living in a time of rapid advance. And as you know, I don't have to tell you this, computers are becoming more and more a part of our lives. And this is something that is transforming the world. Uh, what is it that makes us uniquely human? You might say, well, a good part of it is our ability to process information. We differ from uh, lower animals in our brains, <laughs> which are much more capable. Of, uh, of, of storing and processing information. But we're living in a time of revolution when machines are challenging or competing with our brains. Uh, and uh, this may create uh, economic dislocations that we will see uh, throughout our lives, but also it creates opportunities. I wanted to stress uh, on the opportunities. Uh, a lot of financial innovation is co evolved with information technology. A lot of simple ideas of risk management are ideas that require well-designed information technology. Uh, and we've seen a lot of advances uh, in the last couple centuries that, uh, uh, that uh, make uh, financial innovation possible. So I, I thought I would give you an example from the 19th century, uh, which is very important. And again, it's public finance. I'm not going to stress public finance so much in this course, but uh, it seems uh, I'm going to give the example of 19th century information technology and the 19th century invention of social security. So um, let's go back to the 19th century. That's the 1800s. That was a wonderful century for information technology. You probably don't think of it that way because you say, wait a minute, the computer wasn't invented until the 1940s. Uh, actually, you would be wrong. The computer was invented uh, in the 19th century by Babbage, although he didn't actually make one, but he wrote down a design which was similar to uh, what we do now. But there were a lot of other things that happened uh, in the 19th century that advanced information technology and made finance really powerful. One was paper. <laughs> this sounds very simple. At the beginning of the 19th century, in 1800, paper was handmade out of cloth. That's the way they made it. Paper, therefore, was very expensive. And so if you bought a newspaper, uh, uh, it would be only two sheets because it was so expensive, not all the thick paper that we have today. And it would cost something like 10 or $20 in today's prices. So it would only be wealthy people who would buy that every day. Uh, and uh, they invented the paper machine so they could mass produce paper. Didn't have to be handmade anymore. And they invented wood pulp paper so it didn't have to be made out of cloth anymore. Uh, and so the price of paper fell. So that created opportunity for record keeping, which was very important uh, uh, because that's what finance is built. You need financial records. You can't have just one copy. You have to have multiple copies. They also invented um, uh, carbon paper. 
Maybe you don't even know what this is. Do you all know what carbon paper is? <laughs> I, I guess you do know what this is, right? <laughs> it's obsolete. Do, do you have any carbon paper, anyone here in your room? You do? OK, so it's not obsolete. But anyway, it's just uh, paper with uh, some black material on it. So you put it between two pieces of paper, and you write on the top one, and it creates a copy on the bottom one. And you can, make multi- you can put three or four. The copy gets worse and worse each time, but you've got multiple copies. That's information technology. Uh, and so that you really need that, because if you have only one copy of something, you don't have a backup. So you could store the one copy separately. Also in the 19th century, the typewriter was invented. Okay. Of course, that's, you know, that may be the core idea of a computer. Your computer looks like a typewriter. But a typewriter just speeds uh, recording of information. Uh, you know, tests showed in the 19th century that people could type four or five times as fast as they could handwrite. And, and there's no ambiguity because it's very clear which key was struck. Whereas handwritten, fast handwriting, it becomes uh, impossible to read or difficult. Um, another thing that happened, they started developing, it's not invented in the 19th century, but they started doing standardized forms. That is, there'd be a printed form on paper with spaces to fill in the numbers or other things. That put a sort of organization on the data entry that was unknown. So you have a standardized form, and you've got carbon paper between them, and you typed it. All these really created much more accurate and uh, uh, at, uh, techniques. We also got better bureaucracy. Uh, that means uh, we started to learn management science in the government, and so that government, uh, and also in corporations, so that they could manage effectively. So in the United States, we developed the civil service. It used to be that government officials were all picked by <coughs> political patronage, and they are very often were incompetent. So we set up, a, this is not a new idea, this goes back to China thousands of years ago, but it started to be widely done. So you had a civil service exam that established your competence. So you had competent people with their typewriters and carbon papers. Uh, also, the filing cabinet. That sounds like a minor thing. It was invented in the 1890s. Okay? Before that, people used to put papers in piles, tie them up in ribbons, and put them on bookshelves or in drawers. The filing cabinet was much more orderly and um, effective. Uh, and so all those things developed in the 19th century. And it just created a new world uh, for, uh, for uh, for financial opportunity. Uh, so things started to happen in response to this, and risk management got better. So I wanted to talk about Social Security as a risk management uh, technique that developed in the 19th century. Uh, and it developed in Germany. Uh, and it is very interesting to me because it's a discrete invention that happened in a point of time uh, in response to information technology. This was 1889 under the government of Otto von Bismarck, uh, although he has nothing to do with this, I think. It was other people, economists in, uh, in Germany, that, um, uh, that invented this idea. So uh, what did they do? Uh, oh, I should have also mentioned another inf- really important information technology that developed in the 19th century is the Postal Service, although we had mail before then. But in the 19th century, they decided that they just got really good at delivering mail. In uh, 1799, it would cost so much to mail a letter. I don't know exactly, something like 10 or $20 to mail a letter at today's rate, and it would take a long time to get there. So for most people, it was prohibitively, I'm talking in today's prices, roughly speaking, most people wouldn't ever mail a letter or get a letter. Uh, too expensive, not to count only the paper. <laughs> Everything was expensive. But in the 19th century, they developed postal uh, services and interacted with the railroad. They started having mail cars on trains, and they started having postal sorting on the train. That They were speeding the mail uh, so that they th- didn't have to wait to, to sort it before it went on the train. It was sorted while it was moving on the train. 
Germany was very effective in these. Uh, they were they were had an advanced bureaucracy, a good postal service, uh, and then they had a network of post offices all over the country. Every little town had a post office. So this was the internet of the 19th century, and it really changed everything. So in 1889. German government decided to use the postal service as an information network to create social security. And they created a new law which said that every person who works in Germany has to pay the government a certain percent of their income into the social security system. Uh, and uh, in addition, the employer has to match uh, th this so that both the employer and the employee has to do it. Now, how how in the world can somebody actually make that work for a whole country? There were 11 million workers in Germany at the time, and other countries looked on this as this is ridiculous. No government can actually man manage the system like this. But they did it through the postal system. You had to make your your or your employer can do it for you. They take it the money to the post office, and the post office would give you stamps. It was already the same technology they used for the mail. And you kept your social security card, and you pasted stamps on it that proved that you paid it. And they kept a, a copy of that, and they filed it away. And the government had a complete record of your payments into the system. Then the design was that when you reached the retirement age, uh, you would then get a funds from the government for the rest of your life, your, your retirement funds. Uh, and uh, how did they decide how much? It was based on what you contributed. They, they would pull out your entire life history of contributions. They had it, because you had filed it all at the post office, and everything was bureaucratic and efficient. And they calculated according to a formula what you would get. So it was a real insurance system. And then they would pay you uh, in your uh, retirement. So the London Times in uh, 1889 said, this is going to be a fiasco. There's going to be so many mistakes. and. There's going to be so much uh, uh, complaints that this whole system is going to crumble and fall. But it didn't. It actually worked. And so before long, the UK copied it. The US was practically the last country to copy this system uh, because the, in the 1930s uh, because it didn't sound American. We were kind of reluctant to take on ideas uh, from Germany, <laughs> of all places. Uh, but we finally did, and we did that during the Great Depression. Uh, when it suddenly seemed like we really needed to do something. So that's an example. You see how information technology created a social security system. Now, the, the, the really fascinating thing is we have the same system today, except we don't use the Postal Service as the conduit anymore. Now it's uh, all electronic and it's done via the internet, but it's the same thing. You will see deducted from your paycheck, and you already have seen this, it says FICA. And then there's a certain amount. It's a certain percentage of your paycheck, and the employer matches, just like in Germany in 1889. And when you retire, the U, uh, you can actually get it now electronically, uh, your entire employment history, all your contributions. And when you retire, there's a formula. You can find it on the Social Security System website, which resembles the formula that they did in 1889. So we're still doing the same thing now. This invention of Social Security is well over a hundred years old. Uh, but I think that because of the rapid advance of information technology, we're going to see a lot more progress over your lifetime. There's going to be a lot more inventions like this. And so that's why I think finance will be an interesting field. And it's, uh, it's um, for you, for those of you who choose to go into it. Now, finally, I just want to say next lecture is January 28th. Uh, and we're going to talk about. Portfolio diversification, which is one very important application of the fundamental principle of risk management, uh, but as applied to securities. And it's, it's more narrow than my very broad discussion. It's not public finance, it's not insurance, but it's, a, it's one of the most important uh, fundamental theories that uh, underlies finance. And then uh, you have a problem set which is due. Uh, on that day is well, your first problem set. And the problem set is up on the website. So if you go to Classes V2 and you click on Problem Sets, it's problem set number one. Uh, we're also going to, uh, e I'm going to email you about review sections. And so our first review section will be in the week of January, uh, with your teaching fellows. It will be in the week of January 28th. And we're going to have to ask you to sign up with one of the uh, teaching fellows 
Um, and uh, we'll give you times and dates when the uh, sections occur. I'll see you on January 28th.